Well, good evening to everyone. I'd like to discuss possibilities for creating a, um, a woodland on Gozo and the, uh, the conditions within which are vastly different to those in Central Europe. So I'd like to put everything into context. I also would like to give a brief description about how the Maltese islands formed in the context of the Mediterranean, largely because the Maltese islands haven't been around for that long. In terms of geology, um, uh, our oldest rocks, our oldest exposed rocks, formed only 33 million years ago. And that, for those people who understand a little bit about timelines in geology and geomorphology, you will understand that this is basically um, yesterday. Um, uh, so, so one is not expected to find the fossils of dinosaurs in Maltese rocks, for example, largely because the Maltese islands aren't that old. Not for things, I'll put the, I'll, I'll, I'll try to go through the narrative and, and uh, explain the story as I as I go along, but the the um, obviously the focus of all of this is on uh, creating small woodlands um, on on Gozo. Now let's hope the technology cooperates, which it isn't. Let's see what's happening here. Here we are. So a little bit about myself. I'm a landscape ecologist by training and an environmental planner. I've worked for much of my professional life in conservation, um, both at the university and with the United Nations. Um, my, my field of interest is restoration ecology and corridor ecology. One goes with, with the other. I'm passionate about bugs. I, in fact, I've been working on insects for much longer than, than any other topic or field of, of, of interest. Uh, I started out in entomology when I was only 14, uh, still a student in my secondary years. And um, and now that I am, I'm a full professor at the University of Malta and at an American university, uh, the University of James Madison in Virginia, Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, and, and I'm out on sabbatical for a couple of years working on, uh, on the biogeography of the central Mediterranean using using insects as my biomarkers. So that's basically in a nutshell what I what I do. I have very many other interests besides. Right. So uh, the Maltese islands are located in the central Mediterranean, literally on the crossroads of the Mediterranean, neither on the eastern basin nor on the western basin, but in an area we refer to as the central Mediterranean area. We are politically European, part of the European Union, but geologically African. So we are sitting on the four, fallen margin of the African plate. I will explain with some other slides um, uh, in a moment. So here we are, um, right between Sicily and Tunisia, you will notice, you will appreciate that many parts of Tunisia are further north than the Maltese islands. In fact, the Atlas Mountains in Tunisia find themselves um, much higher up than we are. We are on the northern flank of what we call the Pantelleria Rift. That is the island of Pantelleria. This is the island of Linosa, and this is um, uh, the island of Lampedusa, which geologically speaking is part of the Maltese group. Um, uh, so, so here we are. This is what we refer to as the Sicolo Tunisian Sill. So, so why am I saying all this? Why does it matter for Gozo and the trees? Of course, because the biogeography of the Maltese islands is closely associated with the three continents that we find on our, on on to the north, to the south, <clears throat> and to the east. That's Europe, Southern Europe, North Africa, and Asia Minor, and of course because there were times when the Mediterranean was completely dry or practically dry, um, plants and animals for very many thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, moved around and colonized these bits of rock that are effectively the peaks of mountains. <laughs> you will see that we are on a rather shallow basin here, um, but then to the east, we have an plain 
very, very deep waters. But between Sicily and Malta, we were connected a number of times. It is rather quite, quite shallow. <coughs> so here we are. What is marked in, in the darker green is the Pelagian block, the foreland margin of the African plate. So naturally in North Africa, Malta and Gozo, Maltese islands, <coughs> Lampusa and the Hyblean plateau and this enclave here on Sicily. Those are parts of the African plate that is pushing, thrusting upwards and in places underneath being subducted and in other places riding over the Eurasian plates. The red bits <coughs> are the quaternary volcanoes. So Mount Etna, Europe's largest volcano, and Pantelleria and Linos are just there. And a bunch of other small volcanoes, quite active, and thankfully so, because they dissipate a lot of the energy rather than uh, having us to experience seismic shock every, so earthquakes, in other words, so often. <coughs> Physical setting, we are a rather small place. Um, <clears throat> we're looking at a low-lying group of islands, and this is also quite pertinent to our argument. 96 kilometers south of Sicily, 290 kilometers north, well, north of the North African coast, but also um, a, a distance from the North African coast to our west. So when we talk of the environment of the Maltese islands, like much of the Mediterranean, we like to we tend to talk of the semi-natural environment rather than the natural environment, because a lot of a lot of what we see is not quite true wilderness, but quite heavily influenced, impacted over the millennia by human beings. Notwithstanding such a small place. Um, I, I'm referring to the Maltese islands, we still support a very high biological diversity. As a result of our isolation for, um, many, for many years <coughs> as an island, we do have a number of endemics. Unlike you people in the north, we don't have a spring, summer, autumn and winter, but we have a bi-seasonal climate, a wet season and a dry season. So technically our spring is an ecological spring. As a result of this prevailing climate, our landscape is also bi-seasonal. So we go from a green landscape, and I'll show you some, some images later, to a quite a dry one in the, in the summer. And it, it, it flips literally in two or three weeks, particularly because of the winds. We are quite, subjected to strong northwesterly the prevailing wind as the northwest um which dries both the soils and of course the the, the the seasonal vegetation so all that is left is then the the perennial vegetation because there's quite a few of us <laughs> the human impact the anthropic Im influence is quite quite considerable um, uh, uh, we have, we're talking of about 1,400 persons per square kilometer. So you, um, uh, the density is fairly, fairly high. On Gozo, it's much lower um, because most of the population lives on the main island. In Gozo, I, I think it's around 400, 450, 480 persons per square kilometer, which is nonetheless quite high, but, but it's, it's far different to what it is on the main island. Right, so long before the Maltese Islands came about, there were major episodes, geological episodes in the region. So we had the Sea of Thetis, which encircled much of the planet, and that was about 200, 200 million years ago. <clears throat> During the Jurassic, 150 million years ago, we had the rifting of the supercontinents in the in east-west direction. During uh, um, at the latest Cretaceous, and the Maltese Islands at this point were nowhere to be seen and uh, not even forming under the water, uh, we had subduction of the African plate, particularly in the eastern basin, creating quite a lot of volcanic activity in in this area. And the volcanic the volcanic cock, in fact, is what it's called. 
Then uh, some during the early Miocene, we had the anti-clockwise rotation of the Italian peninsula to its present position, together with the Proto-Ligurian block. So we're talking, of course, it and Sardinia also moving along. But the most dramatic episode, I suppose, that occurred in the Mediterranean that had, that had a profound influence um, on, on everything within the basin was the uh, Messinian salinity event. So for a quite, quite some time, um, first we had the African plate pushing towards the Eurasian, uh, the, the, the Eurasian plate at, at, the, at the Western basin. So here we had, we had the closing of the straits, basically, as a result of which, even with 13 major um, rivers discharging into the, into the basin, the basin still dried out. The basin completely dried out eventually. So it was it was quite quite dry for about 700,000 years. It didn't take long then before further rifting caused the waters of the Atlantic to fill the basin. It, when the, when the study was first um, uh, carried out in by the Glomar Challenger um, in 1973, they estimated it took about 100 years for the basin to fill up. Then uh, it went down to 70. Recently, colleagues of mine from the University of Malta and, and some German universities as well made new calculations and realized that actually the basin filled up in two years. But, so it was quite a dramatic episode. Suddenly, you have dry land that is being um, uh, literally um, taken over by marine environment from the Atlantic as the Straits of Gibraltar reopened. What's going on? Here we are. <laughs> um, so, so when the basin was closed at this end, of course, the Suez Canal didn't exist in the Eastern Basin, we, we ended up with hypersaline lakes that soon started to dry up. So technically, Af North Africa and Italy and Malta and Sicily and, and, and uh, the the, the Iberian Peninsula with Morocco was connected, of course. And with that happening, animals were moving back and forth. Um, the elephants were also in, in Europe, we know. Um, uh, antelope family, a variety of other creatures, fauna and flora, started to adapt to a new terrestrial environment. Then, of course, the Mediterranean reopened and flooded for the last time to date because nothing is forever in geological terms <clears throat> and um, we know that eventually the Mediterranean will again en become enclosed and dry up. We won't be around to see that but it is a cycle of the continental plates as they move around through, through a variety of processes, rifting, isostasy and all of that. So the bathymetry in the central Mediterranean area is quite shallow, like I said, and on this side we have the abyssal plain, which is known as the Malta Escarpment. As the climate changed in much more recent geological times during, during the Pleistocene, we were connected a number of times for certainly with Sicily, it is not certain yet whether we were connected with North Africa again. So there were a number of these land bridges as the waters fell as glaciation took took control in the north <clears throat> parts of germany further north other parts of europe but there was so there was less fluid less water in the system and um and then when the climate again changed and started to heat up waters started to melt the ice started to melt and the waters rose as a result, islands started to, well, the peaks of the highland mountains and that turned into islands. This is just to show you how, how close we are to Sicily. That is Mount Etna, the plume, moving right over the Maltese islands. And here we are, when the waters, when the waters fell, <laughs> we get connected. That was during the last glacial maximum of the Vorm. I will 
talk about in a minute because this is essentially what changed the the environment of the Maltese of the Maltese islands and much of this of of, of uh, the Mediterranean. <clears throat> so there were major influxes of animals and plants that came across as the climate got colder. So the start of the Pleistocene, that's uh, 2.58 uh, million years ago. That was the first influx of animals that came across. There was another um, um, regression, marine regression, 690,000 years before present. Yet another one between 300,000 and 490,000 years before present. Then, of course, the last glacial maximum, which essentially started 115,000 years ago, but it peaked some 22,000 years to the last 17,000 years before before present. Sorry, there are some some extra letters there. It's meant to be years before present. That's that's my mistake. I'll I'll fix it at later. <clears throat> So this is what it was expected to look like. Um, the Maltese islands connected to Sicily where you had animals and plants moving back and forth. And as a, as a result of which formed the fauna and the flora and the environment of the Maltese islands. Much like the rest of the Mediterranean, um, our climax vegetation, our forest is the sclerophyll forest which is dominated by Quercus ilex, by the holm oak or the Mediterranean evergreen oak. So <clears throat> this is a tribute to David Attenborough. This is from his book, The Making of a Garden. Um, so when the waters rose, we had the establishment, the devel evolutionary development of a number of species on the peaks of high ground, that were converted into islands as a result of um, as a result of this um, war incursion by by seawater. What is interesting is that I I don't want to digress, but what's interesting is that, for example, the pygmy elephant and the hippopotamus that lived on the Maltese islands were not existing at the same time as human beings were. Whereas in Cyprus, archaeological evidence shows that people actually hunted these um, uh, these animals and in fact they hunted them to extinction whereas in the Maltese islands people came after um, the elephants the climate changed it was very wet of course what we call the pluvials and um, and the uh, and how do we know that by excavating a place known as Ardalam a cave which is actually a phreatic tube which has different layers within it. And the cultural layer, that is the human layer, is at the top, nowhere near where the elephants, the hippopotamus and, and the deer, and, and all the other animals, the giant swan, the flightless swan, and the giant dormouse. You see, again, I'm going to digress for the, just to make the point. When animals, large animals, are found in small places, or occur in small places, it doesn't pay to be big like an elephant, like a hippopotamus. So the mechanism that sets off uh, the, the mechanism for survival, so over a fairly shortish span of, by geological, in geological terms, of course, these animals start to become smaller. It is known as a process known as nanism. Animals, on the other hand, that are known to be rather small, like the tortoises, like the dormice, they started to grow because they have to compete with these larger beasts. So we had tortoises almost as large as the ones in the Galapagos in this part of the world, <coughs> largely because of this process known as gigantism. They, they actually adapt to, to an environment that is small and restricted with very small resources, and a result, as a result of which, um, uh, there are these, these morphological changes um, in, in, the, in the fauna that is trying to adapt to a new environment. So to give you an idea, this would be the Indian elephant of today. 
and this would have been the pygmy, one of the species that lived in the Maltese Islands, about the size of a Shetland pony or a Labrador. There were about two species, possibly a third one as well. I know that colleagues um, from the Natural History Museum, along with other colleagues from Gibraltar, um, are at the moment looking at at um, skeletal remains and trying to understand how many species there were <clears throat> living in the Maltese islands and in various other islands. I always make the joke about the elephant. If human beings were around, of course, and you had them as a pet, uh, you had them as a pet, you can take it out for a pee in the evening like, like one would take a dog. Um, because, but nonetheless, like I said, humans in the Maltese islands and these, these elephants never, it seems, or at least there is no archaeological evidence that they ever met. Here we are. So the last influx, the last influx that occurred and was not because the waters fell, but because of human technology, boats, basically rafts, <coughs> came some 7,500 years before present. And the first landing appeared, the first settlement happened to be apparently in Gozo, in a play, places known as Ayn Abdul, um, uh, in, in, on one of the hills, the very many hills that you find on Gozo. I will exp talk about the hills on Gozo, because although the geology is very much the same to that of the other islands, the topography is vastly different which gives us some um, advantage, an opportunity we need to exploit when planting trees. <clears throat> so the Maltese Islands have a total area of 316 square kilometers. For some reason, this is not cooperating. There's more text that's meant to come up. Let's see what's ah, here we are um it's a small island group that consists of three inhabited islands most of the population lives on the main island of malta um a much smaller population lives on gozo and the mere two individuals live on the island of comino then there are a number of small islands and islets that are uninhabited but nonetheless very important because of their ecology Altogether, the islands have a coastline of 190 kilometers. Worried about the technology here. <coughs> Why? So this gives us some idea of the urban extent on the main island. Just to give you some idea of scale, that is the main runway at the airport. It's a big runway, um, takes the 747s. This is the island of Domino, where I said only two individuals now live, but obviously visited by very many people um, for recreation and leisure purposes. This is the island of Gozo. There's a race course, again, to give you some idea of scale now like i said that the geology is the same the topography is completely different <clears throat> i'm not sure whether you see on the main island here this line cutting across well here we have a number of faults this is the rubber dingley uplands and here we have a fault line which cuts across literally the main island and then from here on to the south gozo fault we have a series of um, block halting or Horst and Graben uh, system. Um, so you have literally crests and valleys, crests and valleys. With Gozo, it's different. With Gozo, there are a series of hills <clears throat> around which there are valleys and plains and um, uh, areas that are quite secure or sheltered from the exposed from from exposure to the north westerly wind and because the topography is different and the the geo, the, the strata are quite intact compared for example to the east of the main island where the the youngest strata doesn't exist 
And there's a lot of clay in the system, which gives us water perch from the perched aquifer that I would like to that I would like to um, talk about further. <clears throat> you need to bear in mind that there are, and these are where the constraints. These are the constraints we face. There are no rivers, no lakes, or mountains. Mountains, of course, you will know, provide water <clears throat> as the temperatures rise through snow melt. We have none of that. Because we don't have a very high altitude, we have an insignificant climatic gradient. The soils <clears throat> come from the parent rock. The rocks are rather homogeneous. Lower coralline limestone, globigerina limestone, the blue clay, green sand, upper coralline limestone, and then the quaternary material after we came out of the sea. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you had to compare, for example, Italy, which has a tremendous habitat gradient because of the very many mountains in the center, they have more than 270 species of butterflies, the highest in Europe. We only have 22 because we have only calcareous soils. We have no acidic soils, so we don't have the fertilities, for example, that you would have in, in Germany. <laughs> Excuse me. Nonetheless, the flora and fauna is extremely rich, notwithstanding the limited land area and the intense human pressures. We have some 2,000 species of terrestrial plants, of which over 1,000 are flowering, and more than 3,000 species of terrestrial animals, mostly invertebrates, <laughs> also including um, endemics. Endemics means that they are found nowhere else in the world except here. Yeah. I talked earlier about the representation of the, of the, um, of the continents surrounding us. So the biogeography is interesting because we have plants and animals that represent North Africa, North Africa, Asia Minor, and, uh, <clears throat> and Europe, Southern Europe. The Mediterranean is a lot more biodiversity rich than the rest of Europe, we know that. Because the Maltese Islands have a long history of human occupation, they provide us with a wonderful field laboratory for studying the impact of humans on the environment. So there are advantages to be exploited here. Now, let me remind you the, the, the environment of the Mediterranean is influenced by three very important factors, three important elements. The climate, the bi-seasonal climate, the landform or geomorphology, and the human agency. We cannot run away from the fact that humans have been here for a very, very long time and have had a profound influence, impact also, both positive and negative, <clears throat> on the environment. We talked of um, um, endemics. This is just to give you an idea. This is one species of lizard that we find in the Maltese islands, but on the different islands, you have different forms and distinct subspecies. So the, the lizard on Gozo, Malt, and Comino would look like this one, Podarchis filfolensis maltensis. But the nominate race and the much larger um, uh, <coughs> form is the one found on the island of Filfla. It's this black charcoal gray, if you like, and blue spot mottled specimen. Then underneath it, we have another quite robust specimen, um, another form, another subspecies, which is which is also, which pertains to the Godzotin floor fauna, because this is found on General's Rock. Whereas the other one, uh, Keselbaki, is the lizard that is found on, uh, or used to be found on Selmonet. On small islands, unfortunately, we are not sure whether this, this subspecies still exists um, as a result of um, potentially vermin 
rats perhaps and then also human intervention <clears throat> um we're not sure whether whether it's still around um further studies will will need to be carried out to find that out okay so the climate of the Maltese islands so now enough about the Mediterranean let's talk a little bit about the climate the climate is like I said bi seasonal it's either we have uh, mild wet winters and then we have hot to dry summers the summer drought <clears throat> in a winter throughout the winter we can have um, um quite substantial um period of time where there is no rainfall at all 63 percent of the days in the wet season can have no measurable rainfall in fact we haven't had rain here for a good number of weeks and of course the vegetation has to um uh, adapt to its austerity and how does it do that well many of the plants either live under the ground they tide over the dry season as rhizomes as bulbs um uh, whereas the perennial the trees will have roots reaching out to the um uh, to, to to extract and exploit the subsurface um uh, water <clears throat> we get around actually a bit less than 600 millimeters of rain over the year um practically in the in the wet season the islands like i said are quite windswept so less less than eight percent of the year has no wind at all of you know measuring a knot and it's also quite a sunny place of course if you if you're a tourist it's it's quite fine but it's not so if you were an early settler 7000 7000 years ago where there were no rivers no lakes and you had to use the water from the spring line of course the population was much smaller and, and more sustainable but 12 hours of sun pounding down on your crops in July is quite quite something to um, to consider. So it was most certainly not easy, and I'm sure that the existence of the early settlers must have been quite, um, shall I say, frugal, must have been very, very difficult. Having said that, when it does rain, you get these flash floods. <coughs> Um, so you do get water flooding um, areas that um, are at the at the end of a of the watershed of the catchment, and that sometimes happens. So let's uh, take a look, and this is important because we tend to talk about deserts and desertification, and that this is the sort of thing one would expect in the Middle East or in North Africa and the Sahara Desert, you know, Lawrence of Arabia sort of um, uh, setting, but it's not so because in the Mediterranean, um, in parts of Crete, Southern Greece, um, in Sicily, in parts of Italy, in Spain, and here, we are experiencing the effects of climate change as a result of desertification. Now, when we talk of desertification, it doesn't we're not looking at sand blowing <clears throat> and camels and bedouins and and skeletons lying in the sand it means that there is the, the, the water regime changed to the extent that the plants are becoming stressed and we are monitoring this throughout much of the su southern shores of europe and um, it's pretty evident that this is taking place without a shadow of doubt. Um, naturally, further down, the length of the dry season, further south, particularly in North Africa, it gets quite a bit drier. For example, all the black areas here on the, on the diagram on the right, they experience um, uh, seven dry months. <clears throat> we are getting there very slowly and when that happens i suppose apart from the refugees that we see nowadays the the immigration that takes place from africa because of 
environmental and also political reasons um, uh, may happen to us as well in the future and the not so distant future we may in the central mediterranean become environmental refugees you never know because that is where the trends seem to be heading regrettably <clears throat> and if you look at the pluviothermal diagram of the maltese islands it's it's like i said the very bi-seasonal where the rainfall is at its highest the, temp the temperatures are lower where the temperatures are highest, like starting from April on to September, <clears throat> very often goes beyond that, although we can get some rains. Um, uh, then, of course, the rainfall is at its lowest. The landform <clears throat> is quite interesting. The landform is notwithstanding the small size of the Maltese islands and Gozo, these are all in Gozo, we have some very interesting, for, for a geomorphologist, it's, it's, it's quite a paradise. Um, not so much for a geologist, because the geology, like I said, is pretty plain, layer cake formation. The, the, the geomorphology is quite, quite interesting. Um, um, also the culture that you find, I won't go into the cultural element, here you have small estuaries, a sand dune, which is atypical to the dunes you may be used to, where you have the four dune, then the fixed dune, the consolidated dune. You have the consolidated dune just here and the four dune adjacent to it. These are pocket beaches. We have no linear beaches. We have only pocket beaches. Um, here we have a stack, which is the island on which that lizard the, um, uh, that I mentioned earlier on can be found. This obviously some point connected on either side with a cavern on it this is a doline this is a, what we refer to as a solution subsidence structure and down here we have a little island <laughs> we have the clay slopes coming down forming a talus we have a boulder scree we have a pebble beach which indicates a high energy environment we have no rivers like i said so the pebbles are created as a result of the as a result of the action of the waves and here we have a shore platform and i'm not sure you can see what's on it <coughs> excuse me that is a series of salt pans now let me remind you that the maltese islands have no natural resources except for the stone and the creation of salt and and the fairly hardworking um, population. That is basically what the Maltese Islands had always to offer whenever, the, whenever they were colonized. Um, uh, but salt is very important. I'm not sure how many of you realize how important salt is. We take things very much for granted. But some generations ago, the refrigerator didn't exist. And the only way you can cure and preserve meats in a warm climate like in the Mediterranean was by putting it in salt or using brines. In fact, again, some of you may know the word salary that we earn every month or whenever, those of us who do, um, is derived from the word salarium, which comes from salt because because the Roman legionnaires were paid in part in salt because while they were on campaign, <clears throat> invading and killing people, <laughs> they also carried food with them. So they needed to cure the meats they carried with them and they were given salt. So salt is a very important resource. Um, and, and you do get a lot of these salt pans in a number of places. Of course, many of them are now not in use because salt has lost its importance over the years. Um, I'm not sure what the blood pressure would have been like when they actually put everything in salt at the time, but I can tell you um, it must have been hugely, a hugely important resource um, in the past. <clears throat> the magnificent sea cliffs at Tachench, <clears throat> very important. They harbor one of the most important 
seabird communities in the Maltese islands. Um, we don't have rift valleys. We have um, valleys that are known technically as rias. In other words, they are stream eroded. And this is one of them. So this, this valley system is connected with a much larger valley system, which would have been even much larger when, when Malta and Gozo were connected to Sicily. And there would have been a river flowing through here. This is quite an interesting place for those of you who are interested in snorkeling or scuba diving. There's a very nice population of seahorses in this area. That is a 17th century tower um, that were built. You can see another one there in Malta. Um, a number of them were built all around the coast when it was rather unsafe to live on the coast because of Corsair attacks from North Africa. Um, uh, fields here, a lot of cast. I will talk about this in a moment. You see the natural vegetation is growing on very shallow soils. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and on what we refer to as karstland, karst. I'll talk about that. Boulder scree formations, the, the, the rocks that break off the plateau and roll down into the sea and create a lot of important habitats and, and also shelter for many of the trees. Here we have tamarisk trees growing and the number of plants that we refer to as the yellow hayline community. So plants that are um, tolerant to sea salt and sea sprays, aerosols and things. It was a very interesting place goes so for, <coughs> excuse me, for, for ecology studies and variety of other studies. So you see the landforms are on the island of Gozo are pretty interesting, quite diverse. You get a lot of blue clay. This is the blue clay. The, the teal color is the blue clay, which oozes out because of the sheer pressure of the rocks on top. So the three dominant landforms on Gozo, there are numerous others, are the hills. You see hills everywhere, plateaus, buttes. Um, <clears throat> And notice the difference I mentioned earlier on. This is during the wet season. This is on the left during the dry season. It just flips, it just changes very dramatically. Quite interesting. The castland, so you see very shallow soils. And uh, this is a point I would like to make now, and I'll make it later as well when we talk about the planting. We don't have the luxury you have in Germany. Our soils average about a meter in depth. In the valleys, in the shower, in the in the areas lower down are quite a bit deeper, but the further up you go, the shallower the soil gets. And here, these are artificial fields um, that would have been created in antiquity on the castland. They would be very, very shallow. Quite, I mean, meter, meter and a half. Well, this is all artificial. And of course, the clay slopes. I will talk about a I'll, I have another. Um, image of this, we see the sheer pressure of the plateau oozes, causes the clay to ooze out over the hillside. These are all clay slopes on which is growing a clover. Um, uh, it's a cheap fodder. Farmers don't plant it on their land because they earn nothing from it. So they would rather this, they would rather throw seeds across the landscape that will in a sense, it's a it's a one of nature's free goods. And the dominant land use, of course, across the island of Gozo is agriculture. <laughs> Mostly dry farming, dry farmland, but um, people do extract water from the mean sea level aquifer or the or the perched aquifer. And you can tell when if you fly a drone like this um, in the summer months when everything is technically supposed to be dry, you do get parcels of land that are quite, quite green. So like everywhere else, plant growth correlates with <clears throat> adaphic factors, the soils, the topography, and the human agency, the impact by humans. <clears throat> now, the forests 
do not, there are no natural forests on the island of Gozo. And there are four to six sites on the main island that still persist. Um, some of the hallmarks are pretty old, over a thousand years old. Um, uh, but at least we have a model with which, on which we can rely to, to do our thing. Um, it's pointless, so it's, it's pointless planting trees that even if they are native, that are not supposed to be planted in a particular environment. We refer to that as planting an ecological context. So we plant an ecological context. We plant trees that are supposed to be living on riparian <clears throat> areas, on valleys, like poplar trees, ash, and, and, and willows. We plant them there. We can't plant them in areas away from the water. We also plant using the um, another principle of our sociology. So we try to see, to understand the relationship between the canopy, the forest, and the understory. And very often you get a relationship of plants and trees that would normally thrive together. So the more acute and exposed the slopes, the less soil you will get. <laughs> and you will only get a resilient flora. So here, another site on Gozo, you see the vegetation here, because this faces the northerly winds. This little soil is very acute. A lot of the soil will come down slowly. <clears throat> Much further down, the vegetation tends to get taller because it's got more soil and more water coming out of the spring line. <clears throat> here, another site on Gozo where you get the larger plants growing within the boulder trees. This is an endemic plant here, so you are not likely to see it anywhere else in, in the world, unless it's in a botanical gardens. This used to be Darniella melitensis. It's now the genus has changed to Salsola melitensis. Very interesting plant of the coast, but very common in Gozo, um, and less so on the main island probably because Gozo is smaller and the influence of the sea hits practically the entire island. This would be Euphorbia dendroides here, the cushion garig, the cushion, cushion spurge, the tree spurge that you see here. <clears throat> because there's a lot of cast, then of course the steppic environment dominates. This is chamomile. So if you're drinking as I am, um, uh, a herbal tea, this is what it's made of. And then this is an endemic chamomile that you will find quite commonly on the Gozo coast. Where you have step, you have a lot of rock, very, a lot of bare rock and shallow pockets of soil on which very often you get grasses and shrubs like thistles that can withstand the harsh conditions. And because we have, there's so many of us, <coughs> the landscape has been heavily modified, terraced, and on it we have numerous ruderal plants. Of course, we, we like I said, I, I'm, also a, uh, I'm also an academic at an American university. That's because we are on a dual degree. Um, uh, so we have students who start the first semester in the US, and then they come and send, spend the second semester with us. And uh, one of the things they said to me yesterday was they, they were very surprised about how many flowering plants there are. And I'm one of those who says, but we are ruining the environment all the time. But, but wait, I have to qualify that. In the US, they have, they have a lot of areas that are actually managed, a lot of husbandry. Whereas with us, <clears throat> the natural environment still persists even if it's in small pockets. But I must point out that all these yellow flowers that you see here are not native to the region. They were introduced in 1804 
by, um, we had the curator of the Botanic Gardens of the University in Floriana, <clears throat> who had a lady friend from South Africa, who brought him specimens, among other things, and uh, this was one of them. And the Cape Sorrel, which I'm sure you will find in Germany, reached Germany because of us, <laughs> because of commerce and trade in the horticultural industry. It is, it, it's asexual, it does not produce, it just produces bulbils and just moves. Um, uh, it's quite a nice sight for people who are not into um, ecology, that we do know that it is displacing native species. Nonetheless, here it is. It's part of the natural landscape or semi-natural landscape of the Maltese islands. Um, Oxalis pescapre. And it comes from the Cape province in South Africa. I had to put that in because I spoke about ecological spring. And all these flowers are taken in Goto. When we get an ecological spring, which is right now, end of February, early March, <coughs> excuse me, we have an explosion of color much earlier than anywhere else. Um, I sent some pictures yesterday. I was on in the field with students, and the blue flower, the flowers in bloom were quite quite spectacular. And somebody sent me back from Northern Italy, <clears throat> these alpine flowers are starting to emerge. And the ice and the snow is beginning to melt where he is. And, you know, it was quite a contrast. And uh, I don't want to go into the flowering, but <clears throat> the pyramidal orchid is an endemic. Is an endemic. This is a sub-endemic, the stocks. These are sub-endemics only found in Malta and Sicily. Um, so there are a lot of interesting plants to, to uh, study and admire. Now, the island of Gozo. The island of Gozo's highest point is less than 200 meters, has a coastline of just over 42 kilometers, and a land area of 67.1, nonetheless, a smaller population. <coughs> and the, the population, what's interesting in Gozo, unlike that of Malta, which is practically all um, uh, one village touching the other large conurbation in Gozo, they are still quite intact. So they're still quite, as I remember them when I was a kid, um, the village is surrounded by agriculture. It's changing slowly. Um, some people call it progress. Um, I'm not sure. But um, Gozo is a lot quieter, um, except in the weekends when too many Maltese visit. Um, but uh, Gozo is different to Malta. So people who actually work and live in Malta go to Gozo because they find it is um, a lot quieter, a lot more relaxing. They, of course, then contribute to that change. <clears throat> so you see, the villages are still quite intact. Village of Shara, village of Nadur, um, uh, you see, they're all, they're all, Zabuch is literally cut off. It's on a ridge, on a plateau. So the landscapes are mainly rural. Um, uh, but because, like I said, I, I'm sorry I keep repeating myself, because of the topography and the, and the availability of spring water, you get a lot of lush vegetation in the valley systems. In this particular valley, for example, the farmers tend to get just seven, seven crops a year. It's quite substantial. I know there are rights or agreements on the use of water, um, uh, on the use of the, of the land and all of that. It's, it's quite interesting. And this valley then meanders to the sea. <clears throat> Another landscape which is quite dynamic. This is one of the larger bowl trees in Gozo. So the land parcels are quite small, but because there's a lot of water in the area, then the farmers tend to get a lot of crops. 
and the vegetation tends to grow quite well because of the shelter provided by the by the rocks themselves, by right? the boulder screens. And I mean, just to give you an example, those rocks are rather large. Yeah? That's a large truck there, a double wheeler. So you can imagine how big those rocks are. That's a tower there, one of the, the 17th century early warning system towers. <coughs> So right up to the citadel, the main the main town um, of Rabat is the suburb of the of the citadel. Here we have agricultural land um, all the way to the to the city, practically. Although the city is sprawling outwards, um, disused quarries are converted into vineyards and into into orchards. Here we have the garden type agriculture. Um, uh, because it is so close to the spring. So you have pistachia lentiscus, the pistachio plant, uh, olives underneath, and then the farmers here would use these little plots to plant as much as they can. Sometimes they would put citrus um, as well. And of course, people need places to live, so there's quite a bit of urbanization. Contrary to Malta, of course, like I said, it's it's quite, quite still. I don't use the word under control, but um, because the building industry is not quite under control in this country. But um, <clears throat> nonetheless, it's quite different. <clears throat> so I spoke with Stefan last time briefly, and I did talk of my own little forest. I acquired a parcel of land on which I started planting some trees <clears throat> some 11 years ago. Um, and I acquired trees from here and from there, from the NGOs, and I started planting and watering and started to grow. Um, and now, 12 years later, <clears throat> my little forest <clears throat> looks like that. When I can put, I can, bring a colleague, a bird ringer, who would put up a mist net and uh, catch birds for ringing purposes, like even, even like golden oriole, but mainly smaller passerines. And there's only less than two meters of soil there. Um, but the important thing, the important thing is that the trees were indigenous, they were looked after, um looked after by looked after i mean the first three years first three or four years i would water them intensively and uh, come autumn i would use um manures or mpk but beyond that nothing else pesticides of course in fact there are hedgehogs and chameleons and various other micro mammals and, and lizards and geckos in there um uh, and of course, birds, Sardinian and spectacled warbler would breed there. Uh, sometimes I would get zitting cysticola, the, the, the um, fantail warbler buzzing around. And every day I get the blue rock thrush in the area foraging. That's a national bird. So, you know, it's an attractive area for wildlife. And it's very small. We're talking of an area of 13 by less than 10 meters let's say 130 square meters. Um, uh, so it is possible, only if it's looked after. So let's get on with this. So the first thing we need to do is understand the landscape. Now, I know that the Ministry for Gozo hasn't identified them. I have a feeling the sites yet, but it doesn't matter. We will we'll find it, plenty of, Places. I mean, there are advantages and disadvantages with <clears throat> some areas. They're government owned or they're not. So look, we're looking at this this place here. This is this is a place known as Ain Barani. For some strange reason, the photograph moved, the image moved. Um, so you can tell all these fields here are under active cultivation. These here are abandoned. All of this is abandoned. Um, we have vegetation coming down the valley and down the slope here. What does that tell us? It tells us there is subsurface water. The Arundodonax, the great reed, is the rhizomes are actually growing and 
extracting water from the ground. This is an area which has a lot of water because of the perched aquifer. So the water comes down as rain on these rocks. It goes through very slowly. It comes to rest underneath here on the blue clay. And eventually when it is saturated, it starts to come out wherever there is a forest. Uh, that's where our spring line is. Mm -hmm. What is going on? Our photo has disappeared. <clears throat> Strange. Now I'd like you to look at the different soil types. You can see a reddish soil at the top here. That is a terra rossa. Looks very nice, but not good in areas where the wind blows. It dries up very quickly. Soil here has a lot of clay in it. You can tell by the color. <clears throat> so it tends to get parched in the summer, but it has water retention capabilities that are a little better. Then you have soils here. Oh, just a moment. You see the yellowish soil there? That comes from this rock here. It's the same rock that nourishes Ramla Bay, um, where I showed you the, the estuary and the sand dunes. It is um, the transition between the upper coralline limestone and the blue clay. It's not the green sand itself. It is the iron melel member that gives us that color. That tends to be a, quite a good soil, but it needs nourishment. But the best soils are naturally these, the one, the carbonitro soils, or the, the xerorenzina soils, which <clears throat> have a little more detrital uh, material in them, which is, which is, I think, important. The terra rossa is, like I said, lovely to look at, quite picturesque. You see, you see these red, reddish fields because of the iron content within it. Um, but then, of course, it's plastic. When it dries, it, plastic in terms of geomorphology, when it dries, it becomes very brittle. Um, and you can't put plants in it in a roof garden, for example, because they won't last. <clears throat> it's a rather interesting place. Um, uh, even if there are Gossetins on the, uh, online, they may not even know this place. This is known as Ain Barrani, and it's not easily access. It's access to it is not is not easy because one has to bow the car a distance away and then come here and come down through this <clears throat> little valley. Oh, now I know where the photo moved because I had other. <laughs> okay. So here's, you see the color of the sand here. <clears throat> the color of the sand comes from this rock here. Um, <clears throat> so you see, it's a very dry landscape. This is a photograph taken um, during the dry season. Actually, this was taken, I can tell you when, because I was with students finishing the dissertation, so that was taken at the end of May, um, <clears throat> which is already quite a, imagine what it would look like in August. See, when I say read the landscape is understand the biomarkers, the bioindicators, the plants that are growing in an area, why they are growing there, because there is water basically. There's no life without water, um, <clears throat> and we don't have cacti. So <clears throat> it's a semi, semi-natural environment, not a, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's a semi-arid environment, not a hyper-arid environment. <clears throat> so um, uh, the area we choose needs to be, needs to have particular um, attributes that I would like to talk about. You see, here we have farmers that are irrigating the land, that are taking you know, the host pipe pulling water out that has been harnessed, harvested from a valley system. Um, um, it's obvious there's water here. There is a water pump. These water pumps were introduced into the Maltese Islands in the 1930s from America. Um, you get a lot of wind breaks here as well. Um, you see the bamboo, the, the, <clears throat> the sort of bamboo. It's not actually a bamboo. Um, it's, it's actually reeds, grey trees. <clears throat> that they use as a windbreak. See, there's the water which comes down the valley. It's diverted into this water, this water hole, um, uh, a man-made water hole with with um, clay and tarpaulins to hold the water as long as possible, so they can 
utilize it into the beginning of the dry season because the water technically comes from either the mean sea level aquifer, which is here, which is a lens of fresh water, which sits on the denser seawater, <clears throat> or the perched aquifer, which sits on the blue clay. So the pros and cons, of course, it's a semi-arid climate. That is a given. Water retention capability of some soils is lacking, while in others, it's better if we use if a clay in the soil, such as this one. Uh, disadvantage is the soils that is that the soils are quite shallow, and there's quite a bit of land use competition. A um, uh, lot of people, small land area, it's a natural phenomenon. Here we are, closer look at the image we had earlier on. You see the, you can see how the valley meanders down and wherever you have subsurface water and surface water, surface runoff as well during winter, when it rains, <clears throat> are well indicated, well, well marked. Good soils here, there's a lot of, there are orchards, there are perennial trees, um, quite a bit of agriculture. This is the village of Shara. And here, <clears throat> there used to be a waste, um, a, wa um, a tip, it's been converted and it's been rehabilitated. Um, it, it, they did quite a, Quite a fine job, I, I must say. So the challenge is finding oppor opportune side, um, the, the 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 better sites. They need to be ideally state-owned, unless we're looking at um, uh, private public partnership, and they need to be accessible. They need to be near a water source, and that the soil type is adequate and it has. Um, likewise, good depth. <clears throat> if we are to use rotary cultivators to um, uh, embellish the soil and all of that, it, the topography mustn't must be quite lenient. It mustn't be too acute, and ideally not too exposed. Depending on the plants that we choose. Again, please look at the contrast between the dry season on the right and the wet season during on the left. Notice how much abandoned land, like everywhere else in, in uh, the Mediterranean. Young people don't work the land. They'd like to go to university. They'd like to study. They'd like to earn money. Um, so a lot of the land is being abandoned. There's a, all the brown bits here have been abandoned. There's some cultivation here, here, and here, and here. But all of this is abandoned, this cultivation here. <coughs> Again, you notice where the cultivation is, the green, where you get the yellow, the, the flower I showed you earlier on, of course, that's all either fallow or recently abandoned. It's also critical we work with stakeholders. Please don't feel that it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it is important we work with people because people at the end of the day, we, we, we owe it to them, especially if we are doing projects on their land or near their land, and uh, their support is, is vital to the success of any project. Okay, <clears throat> I'm coming to an end. I'd like to go through the trees that I would recommend for a Mediterranean forest. Obviously, the, the main stock would be Quercus ilex, the Mediterranean holm oak or the evergreen oak. A Maltese known as Balut, the Mediterranean buckthorn, Ramnus alaternus, a Maltese alaternu, is normally a species which is found with the holm oak and a variety of other species. <coughs> Accompanying trees, if there is a, quite a bit of water in the soil, we can put Aurus nobilis, <coughs> bay laurel or rant, Maltese. Some plants that we are not very common <clears throat> do not have a Maltese name, Arbutus unedo, the strawberry tree. Um, fairly common in other parts of Europe and the Mediterranean, but not common in Malta. Um, Myrtus 
Comunis, the myrtle. We have a number of place names named after it in Maltese, with a Rehan, um, Morain Rehana. Um, <clears throat> this is the plant. That, sometimes we tend to bring other subspecies of this myrtle from uh, Italy, which has smaller leaves. Ours has the larger leaves, <clears throat> the much larger leaves. And it's important we use local stock, of course. <clears throat> we need to plant species that are good for the pollinators. We need to attract pollinators. So I'm suggesting Spanish broom, Spartium yuncium. The Judas tree, Circes siliquastrum, which is <clears throat> um, uh, deciduous, and uh, Sigrata juda, and uh, Rosmarinus officinalis, the rosemary or clean. Um, uh, these are important plants as accompanying or understory. These are hugely critical because at the end of the day, we're not planting species in a greenhouse. We want it to be alive and we want not only um, active microorganisms in the soil, but we also want the pollinators to, to come to our site. Very often where you get Quercusilex, the understory comprises bears breaches, Acanthus mollis, Hanawi, are very common in the Maltese islands, particularly in areas where there is quite a bit of water in the soil. This is a very common plant, Pistachia lentiscus, the mastic tree or lentisk, deru, Maltese, but it's become quite invasive. <clears throat> so we have to be careful how many of this we put into the site and where we put them. Ideally, they put on the periphery of the site so that they can grow outwards rather than inwards and we can control them. But they're rather good for berries and for passerines. Let's not forget, Without natural bodies of water, like like lakes and, and and rivers, our wetlands are mostly saline marshlands. They're not good for certain birds to drink. So in the winter, when we have wintering migratory birds, <clears throat> they need to find their sugars from somewhere. They need to find the nutrients from somewhere. They need to find fluids from somewhere. And sometimes prickly pears also help, although I'm not advocating the use of the prickly pear because it's a bit of an invasive alien, but nonetheless has its place in the Gossetan landscape. <clears throat> Quite a culture, it's got cultural importance. And now I'm not talking only about it's, it's uh, the food it provides us, but because it provides a function as a corridor, it provides <clears throat> shelter for micro mammals and invertebrates. And um, and it also delineates people's property where they can't build rubble walls because of the clay that will keep demolishing the, the rubble wall. So <clears throat> here I'm talking as a landscape ecologist rather than a terrestrial ecologist. We might want to introduce a native conifer. Notice it's only found in Europe, within Europe, in Spain and the Malta. Fortunately, there are no native populations in Gozo but there's no reason why we shouldn't introduce it. <clears throat> it has been planted for embellishment purposes in Gozo, but it doesn't grow na naturally. Um, it's the Barbary Tuya, or the Sarandak gum tree in Maltese, and even in Arabic, it's known as the Arar. Um, very nice tree, and I, it's, it's one of those <clears throat> endangered conifers that we should be promoting. So we might want if we have an area large enough, we might want to use Tetraclinus articulata <clears throat> on the areas that are perhaps more semi-arid. And of course, <clears throat> why should we forget the archaeophytic trees? They are not native trees, the carib, the olive, the pomegranate, the egg, they're not native, they are archaeophytes, <clears throat> which means they were brought in to the Maltese islands in antiquity, but they have regenerated. And they're wonderful trees, not only part the, because we don't have an autumn, 
this gets us the pomegranate brings us the closest to Europe because it turns yellow, literally yellow before it sheds its leaves. But more importantly, the fruit they provide, <clears throat> not only for us, for birds. The, the amount of passerines that visit these trees because of the fruit is outstanding, particularly, particularly in September when things are still very dry. <clears throat> the olive tree, <clears throat> Sijrata Zebuch, or the old world, Zaytuna, and the pomegranate, Rumina. And here we are. I come to an end. I'd like to thank you. <coughs> Not sure where, where, what happened there. There we are. Um, uh, it, something just came up. Microsoft PowerPoint would like to access the camera. Allow. I haven't done anything to stop it. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. That was quite interesting. I have one question. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about irrigation? How can we get uh, water in this area uh, regularly and over some time of period? Well, I was hoping, <clears throat> I was hoping um, the ministry would have chosen the site already, but they haven't. They're looking at sites, so it all depends on the site they choose. So there are a variety of ways. They can either bring in water using a water tanker, a bowser, or they can they can have water on site already. It all depends on where the site is. Um, if the site is one in one of those areas I showed where there is a seep, there is seep, a natural seepage, then of course we won't need to water so often because the shelter, the, the, the rocks might provide, but also the water that comes from the spring line, from the perched aquifer. It will all depend on the site that is selected. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would be a quite good task for the well, probably for the Gozo uh, students to find out oh. as, as soon as we have the location to find out uh, about the irrigation how how we get the water there how often. Sure. But that is something. Sorry to to yeah, interrupt no you. Um, that would be something that the ministry will need to help out on and uh, and direct us <clears throat> yeah because the site is the crucial the, the selection of the site is critical yeah right for the reasons that i have mentioned yes yes, yes. okay uh, are there other questions by the students by the people who are listening to us well uh, i have a question uh, concerning the soil um you had this uh, map of um, the different soil um, layers in Gozo, and it was to be seen that there is uh, a lot of this uh, blue clay, um, but you said the best ground was the uh, the Rencina, when I got you right. The Rencina, the carbonate raw. The carbonate mm -hmm. raw would probably be better. <clears throat> and the reality is that a lot of the soils have been mixed. Um, uh, over the time, over time, because soils from the upper reaches move down through by gravity through natural um, uh, processes of mass movement, but also because from time to time the ministry clears valley systems from silt, and uh, then <clears throat> gives the farmers truckloads of soil that has been cleared from valley systems. Ecologically, it's not ideal, of course, but from the point, from the cultural point of view, um, farmers that have been losing soil because of strong winds and all of that, and natural erosion processes, um, would would cherish that, and then they mix it in. Some people just dump it there and uh, and use it as a topsoil. Others would use rotary cultivators to mix it. Mm -hmm. the, now the. I'd probably preempt what you are about to say. We, Because Gozo has no forests left and hasn't had forests for a very long time, probably dating back pre the time of the night of St. John, probably even the time of the Romans, the, the forests were gone. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and the forests were gone mainly for fuels. People needed to heat water and do very many things with it. 
<coughs> um, so there's very little, very little um, detrital remains like leaves and, and branches and twigs falling into the soil and reworked as you would get in a natural forest. So the soils are pretty bare in that respect, and that's why they need to use quite a bit of manure in September. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was just wondering if uh, if there was um, a layer of this uh, clay soil underground, which uh, you said uh, has a good um, water um, storing capacity. This uh -huh. would be uh, of benefit to the plantings uh, above. It all depends on the strata of the re of the site that is chosen, mm -hmm. whether it's above the clay or 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 beneath the clay. If it's on the yeah. Globigerina limestone, it is unlikely that you will get clay in it, unless <clears throat> unless of course somebody put it there, mm -hmm. because like I said, it would have been brought in through the government ministry <clears throat> um, in a truck. Yeah. And concerning your own garden, uh, what kind of um, soil is there on the ground, if I may ask? It's interesting. <laughs> I had no, I didn't have much of a choice. Well, I did choose carbon neutral soils in the beginning, but then the supplier ran out and he started bringing me a mix of Xerorenzina with Terra Rossa. And in fact, the plants on the left hand side grew a lot faster than the plants on the right hand side. Uh -huh. And that was quite interesting. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was quite interesting. It was very telling. And it wasn't a question of exposure because the plants on the left are facing the prevailing northwest, the northwest. The plants on the right are, are facing the northeasterly, which is not common. And yet, <clears throat> because the, the soils were poorer, it took them a longer time to. To, now, now everything is fine. They're getting along quite well. I suspect that the rooting system has moved across from one side to the other. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't use drip irrigation. I'm not keen on drip irrigation, although many horticulturalists will tell you it's a good idea. I find in a windy place like Malta and Gozo, of course, when I say Malta, I mean the Maltese Islands, <clears throat> where you have the drip, you tend to get the rooting system forming underneath the pipe where the water is. And it does not, the roots don't venture away. So then you have very strong winds and the tree will topple when it's big. I have I have a Populus alba, poplar tree, that is about two and a half stories high. If I had drip irrigation, when before it sheds its leaves, it would become like a sail in strong winds and it would it will most certainly topple over. So, um, so yes, I, unfortunately, we don't have, as my father would have had and people before me um, would have had the choice of the better soils. Mm -hmm. Now is what you, what you find is all you will get. I see. Okay. Very interesting. And uh, Thank you. Um, I do apologize for my, for my coughing. No, 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 no. We're, we're just happy you're here, you know. <laughs> And it's quite interesting because it sounds in, in, in a couple of ways very experimenting what we are doing there in, in ways of soil, in ways of plants and climate oh. and getting the irrigation or the watering and stuff like that. It's an experiment. It makes it more interesting, I guess. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kassar. It was very You're interesting uh, and um, homoresque in some, <laughs> in some ways. It was very... Very nice to listen to you. I hope uh, all you guys who are with us um, had the same fun as I. Uh, if you don't have any other questions, we can wrap it up two minutes before time. That's great. Cool. Uh, any any questions? Doesn't look right. Like okay. So then I would say we have it. Thanks very much to everyone and especially to Professor Kassar. And we see each other next Thursday, I guess. Next Thursday, uh, same time, 17.30, and it's about financing and marketing. Uh, one part, the marketing part is by me, and financing is by Rasmus. You don't know him yet, but you will. And uh, until then, 
Have a nice time, have a nice weekend, and dream of tiny forests, as I always say. See you. Bye bye. Have a good evening and nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye.